Well, I did say to expect delays in my previous video about Artemis 1. Two months ago, NASA attempted twice to launch the giant Artemis 1 space launch system rocket on August 29th and September 3rd. Each attempt was thwarted by different issues, which I'll discuss in this video. Now NASA says it's ready to try again as early as November 14th. But the question many have is, are they? If you haven't watched my overview video for Artemis 1, be sure to watch it as it details the objectives of the first SLS launch as well as how it paves the way for human flights to the moon in the next several years. You can click on the link right here or in the description below, but briefly, Artemis 1 is an uncrewed flight to the moon and back. It's the first fully integrated flight of the Space Launch System rocket in Orion spacecraft. It's set to launch from Launch Complex 39B at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. SLS will send Orion toward the moon where it will place itself into a distant retrograde orbit before returning to Earth, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean several weeks later. The goals are to test the rocket and spacecraft systems in their respective environments, prove that Orion's heat shield can withstand the lunar return re-entry velocities, and demonstrate the people and facilities on the ground are ready to support future SLS and Orion missions. If successful, the next flight, Artemis II, is expected to fly three NASA astronauts and one Canadian astronaut on a week-long free return trajectory around the moon. This flight, slated for around 2024 or 2025, would be the first time people venture into deep space since 1972. So there's a lot riding on this mission to go well. It's long past time for humans to return to the moon. It's also time for you to launch this video's like button into orbit. It helps with the YouTube algorithm and lets me know what you're all interested in. The first launch attempt on August 29th was promoted with great fanfare by NASA. It was to fly sometime during a two-hour window that opened at 8.33 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. We are going flags were placed everywhere on the lawn in front of the countdown clock located five and a half kilometers from the launch pad. Moreover, at least a quarter of a million people from all corners of the country and the world showed up at the Space Coast to find their spot to watch. In the days before the planned liftoff, photographers placed remote cameras to capture unique shots of this historic mission. I was at the press site waiting for propellant loading to start very early in the morning, but offshore storms delayed that by an hour, finally beginning by about 2.30 a.m. Ground equipment then began the process of slowly pumping in more than 2 million liters of liquid hydrogen and 742,000 liters of liquid oxygen into the core stage. When liquid hydrogen began entering a fast film mode, a small leak was detected in the tail surface mast umbilical at the base of the mobile launcher. The probable culprit was an 8-inch quick disconnect seal. Engineers stopped the flow and then tried again to see if the leak continued, and it did, and was stopped because of an overpressure alarm. Ultimately, engineers determined the leak was concerning, but at a manageable size. The safety limit for ambient hydrogen levels is 4%, according to NASA. A sensor inside what's called a purge can was showing a concentration of 1.8%. NASA continued with fueling and got the propellants into a topping mode by about 5.30 a.m. before starting to load the liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen into the upper stage of the rocket called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. As launch time crept closer, it became clear that the Artemis 1 mission would not make the opening of the window at 8.33 a.m. Several other problems were being worked on, including issues with communications, links with Orion, as well as a leak in a vent valve. But the real showstopper came when the engine bleed kickstart procedure started to begin conditioning the SLS rockets for RS-25 engines for ignition. A sensor on engine number 3 was showing an off nominal reading. The sensor was showing that the engine had only chilled to about minus 230 degrees Celsius instead of minus 250. After working a number of options to get the sensor to show the proper temperature, a scrub was ultimately called at 8.34 a.m. in order to give teams more time to troubleshoot the problem. It was later determined to be a bad sensor on the engine and that there are other sensors that can act as witnesses to confirm the engine is at the appropriate temperature for launch. It was a disappointment for sure, but also to be expected for a new rocket. Besides, a storm came into the area during the launch window that would have probably caused a scrub anyway. Surely, when NASA tried again on September 3rd, there will be no showstoppers, right? Well, fast forward to September 3rd. The two-hour window that the agency was targeting was to open at 2.17 p.m. This was a Saturday, and many more people were expected to show up to the Space Coast. The weather for this attempt was looking much better, especially near the end of the launch window. Propellant loading began just before 7 a.m., but when liquid hydrogen began entering the core stage in a fast-fill mode, another overpressure alarm was triggered, and the loading stopped. 
It was in the same area as the first attempt, but this time it was much larger. Engineers attempted multiple times to reseat the seal by stopping the flow of hydrogen and warming the lines before beginning again to flow the super chilled liquid into the core, but the leak persisted. The launch director called a scrub at about 11.17 a.m. NASA would later say that the perch can sensor detected a hydrogen concentration of up to 8%. The agency decided it needed to replace that seal on the 8-inch quick disconnect on the tail service mast. The work was to be done at the pad. Following that, a tanking test would be performed to verify that the repairs worked. It would be similar to the wet dress rehearsal tests that NASA performed earlier in the summer with mixed success. So launch was delayed until at least late September. After replacing the seal, NASA ultimately performed the tanking test on September 21st. It felt very much like a wet dress rehearsal with what the agency said was a kinder, gentler approach to loading hydrogen. Technicians also wanted to verify the new kickstart bleed procedures to prove that other witness sensors could confirm engine number three's temperature. It's important to note though that there was also a hydrogen leak during the final wet dress rehearsal on June 20th, also at the quick disconnect umbilical. Teams were not able to fix that leak then, but proceeded to slowly fill the hydrogen tank as well as the rest of the tanks, but this meant they had to mask data associated with the leak that would have triggered holds on the ground launch sequencer. The goal was to get as far into the test countdown as possible, but at a cost. Engineers were not able to perform some of the pressurization tests that it would have done otherwise. Regardless, that modified wet dress rehearsal made it all the way to T-29 seconds before the flight computer triggered an abort as expected because of the leak. The problems with the two countdowns on August 29th and September 3rd led many to wonder whether these issues could have been caught had NASA decided to attempt another, more complete wet dress rehearsal and got the countdown all the way down to the planned T-9.34 seconds before cutoff. NASA has stood by its decision, however. When hydrogen began flowing into the SLS core stage for the September 21st tanking test, another leak was detected, which surprised many as it appeared to be from the same location. So the team once again stopped the flow, let the line warm up, and then very slowly increased the pressure to fill the core stage tank. In a way, it was an even kinder, more gentler approach that they initially planned. But the leak eventually fixed itself, and managers continued with the fueling of the core stage. Once the ICPS was fully fueled, teams performed a number of pressurization tests on the rocket before concluding the test at T-10 minutes on the countdown clock. NASA said all of its objectives were met with the tanking test, but some in the media still wondered if the hydrogen problem was truly solved. I suppose time will tell. Hydrogen, the smallest molecule, is a tricky thing to contain, and even after three decades of use with the space shuttle program, NASA still has issues with it from time to time. After the tanking test, NASA announced it got a multi-week waiver to extend the life of the flight termination system batteries, which are used to destroy the vehicle in the event the rocket fails during launch. This would have allowed SLS to launch in late September, but it quickly seemed that the waiver wouldn't matter as a powerful hurricane began forming in the Caribbean. NASA kept an eye on the path of Hurricane Ian, hoping it would veer toward the Florida Panhandle. However, it wasn't meant to be. The track was beginning to look like it was going to hit the Gulf Coast of Florida, so NASA made the decision to return the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building and secure it. This meant that the potential launch dates of September 27th and October 3rd were now out of the question. And so was most of October for that matter. To make matters a little more dramatic, there was a small electrical fire in the same high bay as SLS right after the rocket returned to the VAB. But NASA officials said it wasn't near the rocket and that it was extinguished relatively quickly. The Category 5 Hurricane Ian made landfall in the Fort Myers area. The system weakened to a tropical storm as it crossed the state. In fact, it appeared that the center of circulation of the end went right between the two launch pads at Kennedy Space Center. After the storm passed, NASA confirmed there was no damage to flight hardware for Artemis 1 and the facilities at Kennedy Space Center were in good shape with only a few minor water intrusions in a few locations. Over the next couple weeks, engineers worked to replace flight batteries for the ICPS, the boosters, as well as those for the flight termination system for both the boosters and the core stage. Inside Orion, NASA replenished specimens and batteries for biology experiments that will fly around the moon. Additionally, batteries associated with the crew's seat accelerometers and space radiation experiments were recharged. After all the work was completed, rollout for the massive SLS rocket for the Artemis 1 mission occurred on November 4th. 
This was the fourth time the rocket left the cavernous vehicle assembly building to head to the pad, and hopefully it will be its last. As of this publication, NASA has targeted November 14th. Editing me here, yet another hurricane has come into South Florida and caused yet another delay. Is this rocket cursed? NASA opted to have the rocket ride out the storm at the pad. Launch is targeted for 1.04 a.m. November 16th, assuming NASA finds no damage to the rocket once it inspects the vehicle. It can withstand up to 85 mile per hour wind gusts. Thankfully, the worst of the storms stayed far enough south. Be sure to check NASA's website for up-to-date launch times because this thing could slip again. Now back to past me. NASA has said in the past it prefers a day launch, but it would launch at night if needed. There aren't really any mission constraints preventing a launch in the dark. In fact, the agency has a myriad of infrared tools that can see the rocket as it flies spaceward. For us on the ground trying to photograph the launch, however, it'll be a bit more difficult. No matter what though, it'll be a treat and a spectacle for all those close enough to see and hear this behemoth take to the skies. If NASA needs to use November 19th, the launch would be during a two-hour window that opens at 1.45 a.m. Eastern Time. For the November 16th attempt, that would see Orion return to Earth, splashing down in the Pacific Ocean just off the coast of San Diego on December 11th after about 25 days in space. This is what NASA considers a short class mission. Again, watch my previous video to understand what that means. The next available daytime launch is 7.06 a.m. November 22nd, with options on November 23rd through 25th and November 27th. The liftoff times shift further into the day as the month progresses. Who knows, if the agency continues to have trouble with hydrogen, a Thanksgiving Day launch may not be out of the question. Time will tell. After November 27th, the next window is in mid-December. As I said in the last video, these dates can change. The most accurate date will be on NASA's website. Do you think Artemis 1 is ready? Will November be the month? Are there still problems waiting to rear their heads? Let me know in the comments below. While we all want this rocket to launch, it's important for it to be done right the first time. There isn't another backup just waiting down the road. As the saying goes, it's better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than in the air wishing you were on the ground. A massive failure would set the entire Artemis program back by years or worse. And it likely won't affect just SLS and Orion. There would likely be ripple effects throughout the industry, including potentially with opportunities for the Commercial Human Landing System program. Are there problems with SLS? Yes, absolutely. Is it overly expensive? Absolutely yes. Since 2011, the United States has spent $24 billion on just the development of the rocket. Combine that with $20 billion for Orion since 2006, plus upgrades to ground support equipment, and we're already at around $50 billion and still no people on the moon. That's also before any money is spent on in-space hardware to send people to the surface and conduct actual science to begin preparing for human missions to Mars. But right now, it's the program that has bipartisan support with the people that hold the purse strings in Congress. Something very hard to come by these days. Without SLS and Orion, there is no Artemis program. And without the Artemis program, there's no commercial expansion into deep space. At least not in this decade. Could the architecture be better? Maybe. There are historic reasons why we have what we have, which I plan to do a video about in the future. But it's what we have to work with, and starting over would add even more cost and time. So let's all get excited about Artemis 1 because it will be the opening of our generations, the Artemis generations, return to the moon. And with companies like SpaceX, Astrobotic, Intuitive Machines, and more working with NASA to develop sustainable commercial access to cislunar space, there's a real chance our return to the moon will be permanent. To learn more about how NASA plans to get to the surface of the moon on future commercial spaceflight missions, you can check out this video right here about SpaceX's lunar starship. If you're enjoying this content, consider letting me know with a super thanks purchase. My goal is to continue to provide quality content about human spaceflight, and any support makes it easier for me to spend more time making more videos. If you aren't able to do that, the best thing you can do is like and share this video and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, Ad Astra.